Hello, my Bill for Thousand Nation. How is everyone doing today? We are back with another Mr. Ballum video. This one is titled, Someone in this story is a psychopath. Yay. All right, let's get into it. Go ahead, turn the lights down low. Put on something comfy. Cut up with someone special. Let's get spooky. Uh, I'm a little nervous. Okay, all right, all right. One person in this story is revealed to be a complete and total psychopath at the end. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to babysit the like buttons kids and give them candy and soda and then send them home with whistles and whoopee cushions. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into it. You can just do that one. <laughs> I don't like candy and will be good. Two today's stories. Shit. Psychopath. In 2008, 28-year-old Chris... Simply titled... Psychopath. Smith was an up-and-coming star in the lead generation business. Lead generation is not a flashy business. Basically, you create these ads that are designed to generically help people with things like lowering their mortgage payments or reducing their credit card debt. And in these ads, you leave behind a 1-800 number for anybody interested to call. And the people that do call, their information is taken down. And then the lead generator, the person who made that ad, they sell that information to mortgage brokers and debt consolidators and anybody else that wants so basically what he's saying is all those people that you wish dead whenever you get those phone calls at like 3 o'clock in the morning, he's one of those people. Hmm. I, hmm. It's access to that lead. Chris's ability to create these really compelling ads and get people to call said number was so good that it caught the attention of another up and comer in the lead generation space, a man by the name of Ed Shin. Ed worked for a lead generation company called LG Tech in Southern California, and Ed wound up hiring Chris to come onto their team as a consultant. Right away, Chris and Ed totally hit it off, despite being very different people. Chris was a surfer bro who wore flip-flops and t-shirts every day and never went to college. Ed was a very sharply dressed, college-educated father of three who went to church every Sunday. But where they overlapped was their shared desire to become fabulously wealthy. After working together for a little while at LG Tech and doing quite well. When nothing else can bring two people together. The thoughts of being fabulously wealthy. Bring together the most uncommon of people. For themselves, they realized they could actually make a lot more money if they left LG Tech and formed their own lead generation business. And so in early 2009, they did just that. They left LG Tech and they formed a new company called 800 Exchange. And that right happens. away, it took that off, happens. generating millions and millions of dollars in revenue, 80% of which was profit. During this incredible time, Chris used some of his money Whoa. to buy a brand new Range Rover and a beautiful condo in Laguna Beach. And he fell in love with this beautiful ballet dancer named Erica. By and large, Chris seemed to be putting his roots down and really building a life for himself. As for Ed, despite his squeaky clean outward appearance as being this all-star family man and father, he was using his cash to party and gamble in Las Vegas. When Ed was at LG Tech, he would regularly go to Las Vegas to generate business. And while he was there, he developed a gambling addiction. When he and Chris formed 800 Exchange, Ed continued to go to Las Vegas to drum up business. It was something he was good at. Fuck but yeah. he and Chris started making money hand over fist. His gambling addiction grew tenfold, and he went completely off the rails. Ed was spending so much money in Las Vegas, sometimes up to six figures an hour, that one of the main casinos there would fly him in their private jet out to Las Vegas, and they would... Six figures an hour? How... We put him in their very best suite, fully comped. It's six figures an hour this man would lose? 
<laughs> unclear how aware Chris was of Ed's crazy spending habits because Chris rarely went six figures an hour to Las Vegas for that. The men were living their respective dreams until October of that year when Ed was charged with embezzlement. Their former employer, LG Tech, had alleged that Ed Fucking had paid off about two and a half million dollars from their business to fund his wild Las Vegas lifestyle. Ed told Chris these allegations were totally false, but Chris was shaken. He was worried that if he didn't do something about this, Ed could potentially embezzle money from 800 God bless. All right. But, I mean, that could all just be false. I, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it could be false. A lot of big companies, when stuff like that happens, they will run your name through the mud. So, I mean, we're going to take it with a grain of salt for the moment. For the moment. And so Chris went out and got a lawyer to begin protecting himself from his business partner. Over the following few months, Ed and Chris attempted to run 800 Exchange before Ed's trial date, but it was just too difficult because the trust had been totally destroyed by these allegations. And in May of 2010, Ed was convicted of felony embezzlement. In order to avoid jail time, Ed had taken a deal that meant he would need to pay roughly $800,000 of restitution to LG Tech. But Ed did not have $800,000. The only way he could make this payment would be if 800 Exchange, the business, fronted the money. But in order to do that, he would need Chris to sign off that he was okay with that because he owned half of the business. When Ed approached Chris, Chris said, no, nope. I'm not signing that. I'm worried you're going to take... I don't blame him, though. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, I get the situation. You need money. I get it. But it's like... The boy who cried wolf. You believe, you trust, but you know, then when it comes down to it, it's like, yeah. Advantage of me too. But after a couple of weeks of talking to his lawyer, Chris finally told Ed that he was ready to meet up with him and come to some sort of agreement. And so on June 4th, the two men met up. By his part out. By his part out, he's got the money. He's got more than enough money. And you have the whole business and you don't have to worry about fucking head no more. At the 800 exchange office and Chris decided to just sell his portion of the business to Ed for about a million dollars. And then Ed can do whatever he needs to do with the business account to pay down his debts. Despite how crazy this situation was, Chris actually felt like this was kind of a win for him. He got a $1 million payday and now he wanted to go out and celebrate. So a couple of days after this meeting with Ed, Chris emails his family and says he's going to go on a three-week vacation to South America and just go surfing the whole time. He's chartered this 45-foot yacht. He's hired a captain. He's hired a cook. It's going to be this dream vacation. He also regretted to inform them that he had broken it off with his girlfriend, Erica, but he had a new girlfriend who'd be coming with him on this vacation, and she was a former Playboy playmate named Tiffany. His family was really surprised to hear the news about Erica because they really believed they were... It's starting to sound awfully shady. We're going to get married. But the trip itself was not really out of character. Chris had always said for the longest time that once he made it big and had millions of dollars in cash, he would just sail off into the Pacific and go surfing and just be off the grid and live his life in peace. And now he finally had a chance to do I mean, that don't sound like a bad time, like, at all. That sounds amazing, actually. I don't blame him, like... Do that. And so his family said, have fun, stay safe, and we'll see you when you get back. But three weeks went by and Chris did not return to his condo. Instead, he emailed his family again and just told them he was having this great time, that this was the best trip he could have asked for, and that instead of coming home, he was just going to keep sailing around the world and enjoying this time that he is disconnected from society. And again, his family said, okay, have a good time, stay safe, and we'll see you when we see you. But over the following weeks and months that Chris extended this vacation, his emails took a dark turn. Chris started to act depressed and he alluded to taking drugs. And then at one point, he talked about doing the unthinkable, referencing harming himself. His parents were very concerned and told him he should come back home or at the very least, they should arrange to meet up somewhere. 
But every time they said this, Chris would just suddenly change the tone of his email and seem really upbeat and cheerful and said, oh, no, I'm actually just fine. And I just need some time to myself. Finally, in December of 2010, so six months after Chris has gone on this vacation, he reaches out to his brother Paul and asks him if he'll come to Costa Rica the following February to go surfing with him. Paul was excited and said he would go, and he and the rest of his family breathed a collective sigh of relief. This just keeps getting shadier. Like, what? So, do we think that... Well, what are, what are we thinking right now, people? What are we thinking? Because my mind's going crazy, crazy. All right. Did he kill Ed? Did Ed kill him and Ed is pretending to be him? What's going on? Why did he break up with his girlfriend? Why is he now with a playboy? Why? Why? That's so many questions. That now one of their family members would get to see Chris and actually check in on him. Shortly after this email exchange, Chris told his family that he was headed off into the Congo to sell some gold coins to a trader who was prepared to buy them at a 30% markup, and Chris was really excited about it. After this, there were no more emails. The family was concerned that this gold buyer potentially had kidnapped or hurt Chris, but Chris was going long periods of time between his emails to family, and so they figured, you know what, Paul's trip to Costa Rica where he's going to meet up with Chris is coming right up, so let's hold off doing anything drastic until then. But when February of 2011 rolled around and it was time for Paul to fly out to Costa Rica to meet up with Chris, before Paul left, he called the hotel in Costa Rica to confirm the reservations Chris had supposedly made. And the hotel said, we've never heard of Chris Smith. There are no reservations under his name. And so Paul tried to contact Chris, but to no avail. And so Paul told his family about it, and they decided it was best for Paul not to go to Costa Rica because probably Chris wasn't there. And the family instead got in touch with the State Department and asked them if they could help them find their son, their brother. And right away, the State Department discovered Chris's passport had never left the United States. And his family said that was impossible because for the past year, Chris has been sailing around the world. But the State Department said, this is what we got. So Chris's dad, who used to be a cop, drove out to California to speak to Ed, who was the last person. I I mean, I'm not saying that I know a lot about international laws and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure even if you're on, you're on your own private yacht, anytime you make port, you have to show passports, proof of everything. Like even if Coast Guard comes onto your boat and stuff, which they can do, you have to, Show them all the, all that information, too. It's a secret. And to be out there that long and not come across any port or anybody and every... Just before he left on this vacation. And Ed would say he has no idea where Chris is. However, he did say Chris had a fake passport, and that might be why his passport was not showing up as leaving the country. Chris's father didn't really know what to make of this information, and so he decided it would be best to just file a... Well, why did Chris have a... What the... What is going on? I was thinking of fucking head. Missing person report and put the investigation in the hands of the police. Shortly after the report was filed, the police brought Ed in for questioning, and Ed reiterated that he didn't know where Chris was and that he did have this fake passport. And he also said that they had not ended on good terms. They were kind of fighting and bickering at the end, and that's why he hadn't heard from Chris since he left. Ed was cooperative and didn't really have much to give police, and so the police let him go. While the police hit dead end after dead end in this missing person case, the property manager of the office building where the 800 exchange business had been located was growing increasingly frustrated. Shortly after Chris had sold his portion of the business to Ed and then gone on this vacation, Ed had moved 800 Exchange from that office building to another, and Ed had not paid his final rent, which was $40,000. And this property manager had repeatedly tried to get in touch with Ed, but Ed was totally blowing him off. One day, the property manager was griping about Ed and his delinquent payment to another tenant in the office building, a guy by the name of Joe DeLue, who just happened to be a private investigator. And during this discussion, the manager was saying that not only had Ed not made this payment, 
But he had also been recently questioned by police about his missing business partner who was still missing. And so Joe is immediately intrigued by this. And he says to the manager, you know, it sounds like Ed is a pretty shady guy. Would it be possible for me to just poke my head around their old space now that it's vacant? Because you never know. There could be something in there. And so the manager yes. says that was fine. He opened the yes, door to the you old can. 800 exchange space. Joe fucking Joe <laughs> walked inside and immediately found blood spatter on the door frame of where Chris's office used to be. He also found blood spatter on the ceiling and on the walls. And so Joe called the police who showed up and sprayed luminol all over Chris's office and there was blood everywhere. It would turn out Chris didn't sell his portion of the business to Ed. On that day, June 4th, 2010, Chris did go into the office to try to reach some agreement with Ed. But when he walked in, Ed promptly killed him with a knife or some other blunt object. Then he or someone he hired dumped Chris's body somewhere. After that, Ed stole all of Chris's money to pay off the debt to LG Tech, as well as some other large debts in Las Vegas. And then after that, Ed hijacked Chris's email accounts and pretended to be Chris for almost an entire year. Chris never took a boating trip around the world. He never broke up with Erica and had this new girlfriend from Playboy. He just got killed inside of his office. And Ed created this ridiculous, elaborate lie that was designed to make his family believe that Chris had become unstable and that maybe he did end his own life. Or maybe he did get kidnapped or killed in the Congo. Ed was just trying Fuck to make it. a state of doubt that he had anything to do with it. But in 2018, it all came crashing down for Ed when a jury convicted him of killing Chris and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. To this day, Ed maintains his innocence, and to this day, Ed still will not give up where Chris's body is. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode... Fucking Ed! That's ah, craziness. Did the did did the girlfriend never wonder why old dude didn't just come home one day? There's so many questions. I know there's probably more to the story, and I thankfully, thankfully, I have my peoples. Those of y'all will go out here and be like, "Hey, there is more to the story. You need to go check out blah blah blah." And I love that about you guys because there's. Oh, I need to know so much more. I, what, 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 So, still, many questions unanswered for my brain, and, yeah. All right. Well, I know this one here is kind of short. I know it seems like I'm probably kind of rushing it, but I'm recording this on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it's a miracle I didn't make my coffee Irish this morning. I can do that. <laughs> All right. So by the time this gets up, it'll be Friday. St. Patrick's Day will be over. Some of you will remember. Some of y'all will not. I hope everyone has a happy and safe St. Patrick's Day. And I'll see y'all next time. So if you enjoyed today's video, think about leaving a thumbs up. If you're a fan of the spooky, scary, strange, or deranged, think about subscribing. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.